institution is, but giving me a, a much better picture of the institution and what a fantastic place this is. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, being, I think, the institution that's probably more familiar with the book than any other institution I've been to. I've uh, told that a lot of you, all of you have been given it, many of you have read it, so you probably know more about it than I do. So if I say anything wrong up here, then just yell out, that's not what you said in the book, and then I'll ask you to explain it and now I'll, I'll learn something. Uh, but uh, some of you probably noticed when I came uh, up that I have this Frankenstein boot on, um, but I just want to let you know that it's not painful, it's just a, um, a stress fracture above my fifth metatarsal. And um, so normally I walk back and forth across the, the stage. I'm not gonna do that today, not because it's painful, but I think that since my boot would be eye level for most of you, I think it'd probably be a pretty big distraction. So uh, I'll probably stay here at the podium. Um, but what we're gonna talk about uh, this morning, and it's gonna be an interactive presentation, is, is really how we can get students to focus on learning instead of grades. And I do think that metacognition is the, is the key to that. And um, the reason that I really understand that now in a way that I did not understand as recently as about 15 years ago before I really knew and understood what the term metacognition meant was I've actually seen students turn their attention from just focusing on grades to the learning because they recognize that if they do the learning then the grades are going to come. And so that's what we're going gonna to talk about. And um, when I go to institutions, uh, actually, I will turn this on. Okay, testing, testing. There's a green light here. Do I, now, do I need to do something up here? Um, hmm, microphone. Not that one. Ah, this is the one. Okay, it's microphone wireless A. Okay, so when I go to institutions, I always like to look at the mission statement. And uh, I love your mission. Uh, you're here to produce educated citizens and contribute members of society in an environment conducive to the development of the intellect. And so the emphasis is on the environment that you're creating and not necessarily on the characteristics of the students who come. And I don't really see that in a lot of uh, mission statements. And then uh, whenever I speak to institutions in the, um, uh, in the South, or in the, the uh, uh, so the the um, SACS area, I, I like to look at the QEP goal and objectives, and of course, Jesse has made me very well aware. Uh, when I look back at the emails, I realized that I had been speaking to Jesse starting about 15 months ago, getting ready for this, and so I was thrilled to find out that your uh, QEP was about metacognition. And again, you're providing an atmosphere where students will improve their ability to think critically. And again, the goal is on what the institution is gonna do as opposed to what students are going to do. And I think that's significant because I think it recognizes that you, are, you recognize that students have to be accountable for what's going to happen, but a lot of what's going to happen is dependent upon what you do here, and uh, I think that's great. And then looking at the objectives, uh, your stakeholders, all of them will demonstrate knowledge of metacognition, critical thinking, and the five reasoning skills. Faculty are going to participate in professional development in metacognition, critical thinking, the five reasoning skills. And then you uh, finish with students are going to use these metacognitive skills, critical thinking, and the five reasoning skills through the college curriculum and through student services. And so what that says to me is that you have to really be able to translate what this whole metacognition concept is so that students will get it and be able to use it in, uh, in classes. And uh, I love the uh, logo for the QEP um, Bright Idea. And you have all of the different uh, five skills that students have to, to, uh, to master. And I think it's just very succinctly will say to students exactly what kinds of skills that you're expecting them to have. And I say metacognition is the key to this. And so when I look at um, defining metacognition, and there, there are a lot of, of different ways, there are very sophisticated ways that you could describe metacognition, but I think when we are talking to students and trying to get them to really understand the concept and buy into it, it's really important to, to make it very simple. And so just very simply put, metacognition is your ability to think about your own thinking. Oh, actually I have to ask a question, but uh, I'm gonna ask this question, I'm gonna ask all the administrators 
administrators here to please close your eyes because you don't need to see uh, the response of people. So, and I'm going to ask faculty to, you know, at least one person, keep your eye on an administrator. And if you see anybody with eyes open, <laughs> we're going to put them out of here. Uh, <laughs> But this will be helpful for me to know. I know that you've all been given the book, Administrator's Eyes Closed, Jesse, especially you. Okay, <laughs> She doesn't consider herself an administrator. But I just want to know, how many of you have actually read the book? Raise your hand if you've actually read the book. Ah, okay, excellent. Everybody here has read it. And so um, it, it puts me in, a, in an interesting position um, that, as I said, this is the first place I've been where so many people have read the book. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about basic principles that are in the book because the three people who didn't raise their hands, I think that, that they need to know the, the basic information. So I've got to do that. But I don't want to bore the people who read the book. So I'm going to challenge the people who've read the book to think about how you could take it to the next level because we say in academia all the time that repetition is the key to learning. And so if you've read it and you're very familiar with a lot of the things that I'm saying at first principles, then just think about how could I think about this in a different way or how could I advance that so that I'm not boring the 99.9% um, .9 of the people who've read it and could do this presentation better than I can. Okay, so metacognition, your ability to think about your own thinking, the way I explain it to students is it's as if you have a big brain outside your brain looking at what your brain is doing. And that big brain is asking your brain questions and it's saying, does she really understand this information or did she just memorize it last night because the test is tomorrow? It's saying, if she has a paper to write, and I met a couple of really wonderful English uh, faculty this morning, if she's got a paper to write, does she recognize that she needs to start thinking about what she's going to write about? She needs to uh, talk with the professor. She needs to go to the uh, writing center or use resources and start in time to actually come up with a draft of that paper so that it can be looked at, she can make um, revisions, or is she just planning to whip it out the night before the way she did in high school? It is your ability to be consciously aware that you are a problem solver. So that things that come up, you can actually start to generate ideas about how to solve the, the problem as opposed to waiting for somebody else to tell you everything. Because let's face it, most of the questions that students ask us about our classes, where could they find that information? Exactly, in the syllabus. And so if you're not using your metacognitive brain, you think, oh, I wonder when the next test is, or I wonder what the requirements are. And when you start to think that the metacognitive brain says, we can answer that question. And your brain says, well, what am I supposed to do? And the metacognitive brain says, well, what resources do we have? And it points you to the syllabus, and you actually will, will do that. Uh, it is your uh, ability to monitor, plan, and control your mental processing so that if you have a timeline of when you want to do activities, let's say you've got a test coming up Monday and you have decided that you're going to spend Saturday afternoon uh, preparing for that, and then a friend comes by and says, oh, I got these tickets to this great concert uh, Saturday afternoon, come with me. Your metacognitive brain is the one that says, okay, let's think about this. You had decided that we were going to study Saturday afternoon. Now, it's okay for you to go to the concert, but you've got to reschedule that time that you were going to give me Saturday afternoon. And so you actually think through that. And it's your ability to accurately judge your level of learning. And that, I think, is really, really important. Because how many of you have had students who, um, when they um, look at a test or quiz, they'll say, ah, I had no idea this is what, it was you, what you were going to be asking. Have you heard students say that? Yeah, or, or students say, you know, when they get back this test and it might have a D or F on it, and they'll say, but I studied for hours and hours on this stuff. Have you heard that? Yeah, and so I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, those students are, they're telling the truth, not all of them, but most of them are telling the truth, that they have spent a lot of time on it. But what kinds of things were those students doing when they were spending time? And I'm not talking about the ones who were texting or on Facebook. I'm talking about the ones who actually considered themselves studying uh, the information. What typically were they doing? Exactly, just rereading, just memorizing, just getting the facts down. But then when they get to us, we want them to analyze, to uh, use the critical thinking skills. And so they're not in a uh, 
they are not in a position to do that. Now, many places I go, I actually will talk to a student audience and I'll talk to faculty. And I'll ask students, how many of you have ever heard a faculty member say, this is college now. We're gonna operate at higher levels. You gotta kick it up a notch. This isn't high school anymore. All the hands go up. But then when I ask those students, who thinks you can tell me exactly what those faculty members were talking about when they said, we're gonna kick it up a notch, you're in college now. Uh, very few hands go up. The, the uh, few people that do weigh in will say things like, oh, that means that it's gonna be a lot harder here. Uh, they'll say, that means that the tests are gonna get a lot harder. Or sometimes they'll say, that means that we gotta do more stuff on our own. They're not gonna hold our hands. But, and all that's true, but that's not the main thing I think that we mean as faculty when we say we're gonna kick it up a notch. We're talking about requiring them to do those higher order thinking skills, those critical thinking skills. And, um, but students don't know this. So then I'll ask students, uh, how many of you have ever heard of Bloom's taxonomy? and very few hands go up. Now let me ask you here, how many of you would say that you're, you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Raise your hand if you, okay, great. Well let me do it the other way. How many people would say you're not familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Okay, okay. Um, I see a couple of hands because you're probably in areas where you didn't have to. When I first started doing these talks, a lot of people were not familiar with Bloom's, but now that we have QEPs and SACSs requiring us to come up with those student learning outcomes and we have to kind of tie them to Bloom's, then a lot more of us are familiar. But let me ask this, how many of you, of you have actively taught Bloom's to your students? Okay. A lot fewer, thank you very much. I'm going to urge, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later in the presentation uh, about a way to do this, but I'm gonna urge all of us to teach blooms to our students. And now I understand those people who did not because I never taught blooms to students before I got to LSU. Um, I learned blooms as a, uh, when I was in my PhD program because my PhD is actually in chemical education. So I learned blooms taxonomy, but I learned it as a construct for us as faculty to use to target our instruction, to target our assessments, but I never thought of teaching it to students. But when I got to LSU, they were very effectively teaching it to students, and students were responding very well to it. So I said, okay, well, let me try this. And the most common reaction I got from students when I talked about blooms was they'd say, wow, I wish I had known about this in high school. So it opens up a whole new lens for them to understand exactly what we're talking about when we say this is a, a whole nother level. So I'm gonna encourage us to do that. And it's also your ability to know what you know and what you don't know. Now, um, how many of you have had students who, um, and, and I, we kind of alluded to this earlier, but they look at the test and they say, uh, well, you know, I knew all of this before I sat down to take the test. Have you heard students say that? I knew it before I sat down to take the test, but then when I sat down and looked at the test, what happened? Exactly, my mind went blank. It just flew right out of my head. And so they all think they have what? Test anxiety, exactly. So I got test anxiety, yes. Now, I don't wanna make light of test anxiety because test anxiety is a real phenomenon, but if you've got real test anxiety, you're gonna have physiological symptoms. You're gonna have, you know, you feel your heart racing, you may have sweaty palms, um, you just, you can just feel it physiologically. And that's not happening with most of these students. Uh, they don't have classic test anxiety. Now, they're anxious, all right. They're very anxious, so there's a lot of anxiety when they sit down to take the test, but they're anxious because they know that they don't really know the stuff. Because when did they start trying to learn it? The night before, or some of them the morning before, yeah. And, uh, and so uh, I find that this actually also addresses the issue of test anxiety, because students find out that when they know what they know and what they don't know, then they're not as anxious. And uh, one of the ways of doing that is just to uh, help them pretend that they're teaching information and uh, then they'll, they'll do that. And so when we look at um, why it is that most students don't already know this, and this was really important to me because I was one of the faculty members, I was a fairly traditional faculty member until about you know, 12, 13 
uh, 14 years ago, uh, I thought that students already, should already know this stuff when they got to college. It's like, this is college. I shouldn't have to teach this stuff. In fact, when I was at Cornell, I didn't even know the stuff that we were talking about this morning because I didn't think I needed to know it. I was a chemistry professor. I taught chemistry. I didn't have to teach learning strategies. And there was someone else at our center that I would send students to if they had trouble learning. If a student came to me and said, Dr. McGuire, I am studying all day and I'm still making C's. What should I do? I said, go see Dr. Selko. Dr. Selko was our person who was in charge of what we call study skills at the time. But now I urge us not to call it study skills because many times students' eyes kind of glaze over. And you say study skills. They don't want to hear about study skills. But if we call it learning strategies, the reaction is very different. And if we call it metacognitive learning strategies, then that kind of really gets their, their attention. But um, I, I never taught the stuff, didn't think I needed to know it. And then fast forward, I get to LSU, and, and I was director of the Learning Center at Cornell, which is really kind of embarrassing. I was director of that center, still didn't know this. But when I got to LSU, they were, I got the position as director of the Learning Center, uh, probably primarily because I'd been director of the Learning Center at Cornell. But I found out when I got to LSU that they expected me to talk with students about this, to play the role of the academic coaches, which I think is fantastic that you've started, that there's a lot of research that shows that it's really academic coaching that can significantly put students on a different path. And um, so they were expecting me to do this at LSU, but I didn't know how to do it. But there was one young lady there, uh, Sarah Baird, who I had heard was really good at this stuff. And um, so when I got to LSU, they were expecting me to do this, and I, I didn't know how to do it, but I wasn't too concerned um, because I figured Sarah, I'd just send people to Sarah. But then I found out a couple of weeks before I started the position that Sarah was gonna be on maternity leave the whole first semester that I was there. And just like, okay, this is not so, so good. Um, but then I still wasn't really concerned because they had just hired two new people um, for doing study skills. So I said, I'll send them to one of them. Well, one day, one of them came in my office. We had uh, shared calendars, and she came in, and she saw that I was supposed to talk to the student about chemistry the next day, doing better in chemistry. And so she said, oh, um, can I come and sit in on your session with the student so I can find out what to tell students who are having trouble academically? I'm thinking, uh-oh. And then the very next day, the other one came in and said, Sandra, this boy's coming to talk to me about test anxiety tomorrow, and I don't know what to tell that boy. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is not good. We're in deep trouble. So I called up Sarah, and I said, Sarah, I know you were planning to come back in January. This is like the second week in September. I said, I know you're planning to come back in January, but we don't have a clue about what this is. So would you consider coming back just 10% time, just give me four hours a week, because we've heard you're really, really good at this stuff. We don't know what this stuff is, but we know you're really good at it. So would you come back? Just give me four hours a week. She said, sure. So the first thing I asked her to do was have a mock individual session. Just bring back one of the students she'd worked with and, um, and have a session. And so we had him sit at a table at the front of the room, and we just watched the interaction. And that was for me when the flash bulbs went off. I knew that there was this whole body of information that if I knew it, I could be more effective with students, but I didn't know it. So I started reading everything I could get my hands on. I started you know, kind of trying some of the stuff that Sarah was suggesting. But I can tell you, initially, I did not think it would work at all. I thought it was too simple. I didn't think students would do it. Um, and so I would tell students, not nearly as enthusiastically as I do now, uh, but I would tell them you know, the strategies. And then maybe two or three weeks later, I'm walking across campus and I'm hearing this voice way across the way yelling at me, Dr. McGuire, Dr. McGuire. It's like, yeah, hi, how are you doing? That stuff you taught me was so helpful. I'm making an A in that class now, and I was flunking it before. And I'd go, wow, that is fantastic. Now tell me, exactly what did I tell you <laughs> that you're doing? And so over the years, I know what the strategies are. And there are two things that I'm going to suggest that you do, at least two things. Uh, actually, I see people taking notes, and I'm reminded to say, you're going to get this whole PowerPoint presentation. So feel free to take notes if you want to, but you don't have to get everything down because I'm, uh, Jessie actually already has it, so she's going to send it out or make it available. But um, 
when um, th I said, yeah, exactly, what are you doing? And they would tell me. And so I used that to start the repertoire of strategies that I would share with other students. And so what I'm going to encourage you to do is um, when students come and say they're having difficulty, because everybody in this room has had examples of students who weren't doing well. They came and they talked to you, and then they started doing a lot better. But if you're like me, I never asked them to tell me exactly what they did differently, because it's different things for different students. And so just keep a repertoire of those which you can use to share with other students. And then the other thing I didn't do was I didn't keep the before and after scores. But I'm going to ask you to keep track of all those before and after scores because that's really very motivating to students. When you uh, can show a student, you know, you, you made a 55 and you think you're in trouble. Let me show you this student who made a 42 on the first test and made hundreds on everything else. And it really gives them that confidence that, that they can do it too. But it was really important important to me to understand, why don't students understand this stuff already? Well, it turns out it just wasn't necessary in high school. And I know you have a lot of older um, students who are non-traditional, but they've never been in an environment where these kinds of skills were absolutely necessary. Now, these are data from the UCLA Higher Education Research Institute, and I've got six years of data here. The 2016 numbers are not out yet. Um, this uh, survey, they survey all first-year students, two-year uh, college students, four-year college students, and uh, they ask a lot of questions, but I'm particularly interested in two of them. And one is the number of hours that students spent doing any homework at all in 12th grade, and the other was the average that they had when they graduated from high school. And what you'll notice is that this number stays relatively constant, around 60%. It's down to 55, so it's moving in the right direction. More students are spending more now than six hours. Um, but the percent of graduated with an A average, you can see steadily increases. It passed 50% in 2013, and it was almost 60% in 2015. And so when students come to our institutions, their experience has been, they really haven't had to spend a lot of time studying, but they've done very well. And so when we tell them that, you know, you're really going to need to study here, we're just not credible. And they think that we're talking to all the other dummies in the room who might have to study more, but certainly we're not talking uh, to them. And so when we look at um, how why students actually have this, this attitude, what their experience was in high school. Uh, when I asked them, uh, and I, I started asking first LSU students, and now I ask students all over the country, but I'll ask, what did your teachers in high school do the day before the test, the class period before the test? And what do you think they say? Review, okay, review. That I certainly expected. Um, and then I asked them, what did your teachers do during the review? And what I thought they were going to say is, well, they gave us a list of topics, and they told us that these were the things that we really needed to master. But that's not what they said. And I was shocked by what they really said. Um, who knows, um, who hasn't read the book? Let's see if somebody could guess. What are teachers doing the day before the test, many teachers in high school? giving them the test questions and, yeah, and giving them the answers. Now, even if you read the book, you can answer this, but how many of you knew that was going on in high school before you read the book? Okay, a few of us, less than half of us knew this. I didn't know this. Let me just ask somebody, how did, somebody who said they knew this, how did you know this? Ah, we have a youngster over here. <laughs> and she said, that was my experience. Okay, and somebody else? Children, yeah, I have children, okay. Anything else? I, get out of here. I've never heard that answer. He said, I teach high school. And typically what happens is people will say, well, I teach high school. And they'll say, and so I knew a lot of teachers did that. I never did that, but I knew teachers who did. But you said you were required to do that. Wow, interesting. Well, you had to give them the test questions and know that they had the... 
Yeah, yeah. And, and at first, you know, when I heard that, I was wondering, you know, why would teachers do this? Why would school system do this? But I, I think that we have put teachers in schools in such an untenable situation that whether or not they have a job next year, whether their kids are going to be homeless, depends on the scores that these students make on these standardized tests. And so they think that if they do this, then the students are going to do well on the tests and, and things are going to be okay for the school. Now. Um, we, we know, though, that that is not creating an atmosphere where students are learning. But that information did help me understand why so many college students, before the test, they ask, are you going to give us what? A study, a study guide, a review sheet, exactly. So they're just waiting for that. So they help me understand why so many students don't do anything before the first test, because they know that they're going to get the study guide, they're going to get the review sheet. All they got to do is memorize that, and they're going to be fine. And so I think that helping students understand uh, that makes a big difference. Now, the other question, when I found this out, I said, OK, well, if you'd never gone to class a day before, just the day before the test, and you went to class that day, and you paid really close attention that day, what's the lowest grade you would get on the test the next day, and what do you think they told me? OK, most students said B. A few of them said A. A few of them said C. But most of them said B. And let's face it, now on the first day of class, what grade do most of our students think they're going to get in our classes? An A, yeah, they, they think they're going to get an A, but they're not going to be too upset if they get a B. And so the fact that their experience has been that all they had to do was just memorize the stuff that was going to be on the test and they were going to be fine, that I think has a lot to do with why students aren't doing well. And they are shocked when they get that first test back that shows that they got a CD or, or worse. And so when students come and they think they're going to make an A, and when we give them that first test back and it's a CD or lower, what happens to their self-esteem at that point? Exactly. I love it when I get the sound effects, too. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it, it plummets. And so then the normal psychological self-defense mechanism kicks in. If our class is telling them they are not the smart, bright, indi uh, intelligent individual they think themselves to be, then they start psychologically withdrawing. And so they might start to sit further back in class. They might start missing classes. Have you noticed this? They'll get less interactive because they're very, very embarrassed. And when that happens, what happens to the score on the next test? Exactly. I love its sound effect again. Yeah. Uh, it, it goes even lower. So this kind of stuff can, uh, can reverse that. And I tell students all the time that, you know, I don't care if you made a two on the first test. I know you can make a hundred on the next test because your two has nothing to do with how smart you are. It has everything to do with your behaviors before the first test. And I can tell you how to do something differently. And so don't even worry about that, too, um, because we're going to talk about what behaviors you have to change. And that really is motivating to a lot of students um, also. And so if we look at even the uh, results from SAT, ACT, this is 2013, the SAT uh, report said that fewer than half of all SAT takers uh, graduated in 2013 prepared for college level work. That situation hasn't really changed. And then ACT was alarmed by US student report, uh, student uh, test results. Um, about a third of them were still unready for college in English, math, reading, or science, every subject that was tested by the uh, organization. And I don't disagree one minute with that information, that students are not prepared for college. But the question is, do we think that's going to really change anytime soon? No. Are students going to be more prepared next year than last year? Probably not. And so the fact that students come unprepared is that's going to be a constant. And again, I want to congratulate you for being so high and being successful, a successful pathway for so many students who come to uh, community college here to be successful and sending them to four years because that's not happening everywhere. But that's not going to change. Um, and so the fact of the matter is, even though students are not prepared, I don't disagree that they're not prepared, but what I vehemently disagree with is the notion that if they come woefully underprepared, they can't still be very successful here. But what that means is if they're going to be successful, then we as faculty have to help students make that transition. We've got to help them understand the problem with their current behavior that's leading to their current level of learning and current grades, 
and productive behavior that's going to lead to desired learning and desired grades. And I just want to just briefly tell you uh, about a student uh, that I work with, just to show you the power of this stuff. Um, this particular student was a student I met uh, on September 23rd. She was in a chemistry class, and it was an honors class. She was one of these students who had done very well in high school. Uh, how many of you have had students say, well, I did really well in high school, and I don't know why I'm flunking now. Yeah, the, the students who, uh, they're the ones typically who are most shocked by the fact that they're not doing well. And uh, I met her September 23rd when I was doing this presentation to the chemistry class. And what I learned kind of the hard way is that it is best not to do this information, to talk, to talk about this until after students have gotten the results back from their first test. Uh, many times faculty will hear this, and I thought, well, this is going to be good. Let me teach students this the first day of class so they can get off on the right foot. And I found out the hard way, no, <laughs> that doesn't work. Because if we talk about this information before they've gotten the results back from the first test, what do you think their attitude is? Exactly. I already know how to study. I don't know why they're talking about this. See, maybe she's talking to all the other dummies in the room, but certainly not me. And they kind of go into Beyonce mode. They say, if she thinks I need to know about this stuff, she must not know about me. She must not know about me. And so they're not paying any attention. And also, I learned that we can't tell them that the next day the, the class is going to be about effective learning strategies, because if we do that, what's going to happen? Exactly, they're not going to show up. And so I was doing this class, and I got there very early, and there was only one person in the room. This Sydney was the only one. She was sitting on the first row, and she looked up, and she saw me, and she said, are you going to teach us today? And so I said, yeah. She said, what are you going to talk about? I said, I'm going to talk about learning strategies. How did you do on the first test? And she said, oh, I did great on the first test. And I was really surprised, because I didn't think I'd done that well, but I got a 96.5. And I said, oh. Now, the reason I said, oh, was I knew that the first test was worth a total of 150 points. But I didn't know if she'd already taken that into consideration, and she made 96.5%. So I said, oh, I said, well, you know, the first test was worth 150. So was your 96.5 out of 100 or 150? And she got this deer in the headlights look on her face. And she said, I don't know, let me check. And so she went to the course Moodle site. She opened up her laptop, and I was watching her. And all of a sudden, I see these crocodile tears start to flow down her face. And I said, but don't worry about any of that, because this, uh, this uh, a talk today, this session is going to change all that stuff around. And she just looked at me and she said, no, you don't understand. She said, I just got my first calculus test back yesterday and I made a D on that too. And so she thought her academic career was over. And I said, no, don't worry about that because what we're going to talk about will change all that around. And she was very attentive. And uh, I got an email from her October 14th saying that she had just gotten her second calculus test back and she was happy to report that she made 100% this time, she said. And then January 9th, I hadn't heard from her anymore that semester, but I thought about her, I was speaking in Indiana, and I emailed her how the semester turned out. And she emailed me right back, and she said, I'm so happy that you emailed, and I'm happy to tell you that I made a 4.0 last semester. And I didn't hear from her um, anymore on, uh, at the, um, well, okay, January 20th, let me tell you about that one before I tell you about the end of the spring semester. January 20th, and this is where I implemented what I'm suggesting that you do. Uh, I now ask students to email me and tell me exactly what you did differently. And so she sent me the email on January 20th, a long email that said what she did differently. And the biggest thing was the way she did her homework. So we're gonna talk about that. Then May 7th, I emailed her again to see how spring semester turned out. She had another 4.0 spring semester. And so here was a young lady who had started her college career with two Ds in very crucial courses and ended the year with a 4.0. And we're still in contact as of July 26th. She had a CUME GPA of 3.5. February of this year, she had a CUME GPA of 3.6, and that semester she had a 4.18 GPA because she had uh, a couple of A pluses. And so, as I say in the book, you know, feel free to share this, this particular story before you have your own stories of dramatic before and after scores. Share this with students because that is really what students see. This is the hook, kind of. I have found that when I've done presentations and I haven't presented this kind of stuff at the beginning, um, students just really aren't really buying into it because they don't see themselves um, in the story. 
And so um, with Sydney, it was an effective homework strategy. So throughout this, I'm going to tell you about very specific strategies that you can teach students, because I found that that's what makes the difference. Um, before I learned this, if a student came to me and said, yeah, I'm studying all day, what do I need to do? In addition to saying, go see Dr. Selko, uh, if it was somebody in chemistry, I thought I, knew, I had the answer. I'd say, well, you need to study harder. I would say, you need to focus on concepts. You can't just memorize uh, formulas and equations. I, I'd say, you need to work more problems, not realizing that that doesn't translate into any actionable items on the part of students. They need very, very specific stuff. And I found, and I actually found this at Cornell, that most of the students, uh, the way they're doing their homework is very counterproductive to the, what they need to do to do well on exams. How many of you have had students who do really well on the homework, but then they tank the exams? Have you seen that? Yeah, and they'll say, well, I'm doing, I don't know what the problem is. I do fine on the homework. Well, it's the way they're doing the homework. And let me ask, if you think back to the last time you were doing homework, if you ever did this, raise your hand. And unfortunately, my hand will be raised. But how many of us ever, if it was a problem we had to work, read the problem, and then flip back in the chapter to find an example of the problem that we had to work and use the example, or if it was a question, flip back and read the discussion about the question and then use that to answer the question or work the problem. If you've ever done that, raise your hand. <laughs> okay. All of the students are doing that, and this is what uh, Sydney was doing, and they don't know that that's counterproductive, but the process to take them through instead is it will, and now ask students, I said, yeah, I did it too, but when we did that, were we working the problem? And were we? No, what was working the problem? The book, the example, yeah. And I said, but, but the students are very bright. And I said, yeah, um, does anybody remember when you looked at the way the example was written, how many of you remember thinking, oh yeah, I got that. Oh yeah, I understand that. And students say, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I said, but then when we got to the test, if they changed anything at all around, what happened? It's like, yeah, it's like, I don't got that. And so the way to prevent that is before you look at the first problem, you gotta study the information. Study it as if it's gonna be on a test or a quiz the next day. And when you're doing that, whether you're using your textbook or your notes, you're gonna uh, come across examples. And I will ask students, what do you do now when you get to an example? If you're studying your textbook or your notes, what do you do when you get to an example? And what do you think students tell me? I'm hearing some people say softly, skip it. Skip it, skip it. I was shocked, because I, I never skipped the examples. I would actually read it and see what the author did, even when I was just going through the notes of the chapter. But all the students now are skipping the examples. And so we tell them, you gotta commit to yourself that you will never skip another example, because the examples are your brain's best resource for convincing itself that it can work these problems, it can answer these questions, it doesn't need the textbook author to do that. And so you gotta work it yourself. So work it, even if you're not sure exactly what to do next, work it all the way through until you get to an answer. Just power your way through until you get to an answer. And then when you get to the answer, just compare your answer with the answer in the book. If you got the same answer, then you can look at what the author did. But if you didn't get the same answer, don't look yet. Try to figure out where your mistake was. And I'll ask students, I'll say, at this point in the process, do you think making a mistake is good or bad? And what do you think students tell me? Interesting. Faculty everywhere always say students say bad. Students always say good. Always. And I, this has happened, I've talked to both faculty and student audiences, probably 50 of the over 300 institutions I've spoken at, faculty always say bad, students always say good. And then I followed that, the student response with, I said, absolutely. But don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that it's bad if you don't make a mistake at this point. It's fantastic if you don't make a mistake at this point, but why is it good if you make a mistake at this point? And what do you think they tell me? The number one answer they say is, you learn from your mistakes. What else do you think they say? Oh, the, yeah, actually, I've never gotten that, but that's a good response. She said, the teacher is there to help you if you make a mistake on that point. And, and it doesn't surprise me that that answer would come from Georgia Military College, <laughs> because I can tell that you guys love students. And love is really such an important part of this whole process, that we are communicating to students that, you know, we love you, this is why we're taking so much time, and so we're there to help you. Great answer, but I've never gotten that from a student. I'll keep that in mind. What else do you think they say? 
They'll say, well, now I know where my brain is having a tendency to go wrong. Sometimes they'll say, and the key is at this point, they'll say, it's not the test. So I'm not losing points if I make the mistake now because I can fix it. And then what I'll ask, and ha how many of you have ever heard a student say, oh, I would have done so much better, but I just made simple mistakes. Have you heard students say that? Yeah, simple mistakes. And so I tell students, I say, you know, my, my formal position is that there's no such thing as simple mistakes. Mistakes only look simple in retrospect. Once you know what the right thing is, your mistake looks so simple. But mistakes are things that have to be made. And either you're going to make them during this process, or where are you going to make them? On the test, yes. Now, the other thing that's really crucial about this process of helping students understand what they need to do is I don't tell students what to do. Uh, and I encourage you to just ask reflection questions. So I never tell students, if you don't make the mistake now, you're going to make the mistake on the test. I ask them, if you don't make it now, where are you going to make it? And then the students say, on the test. So it's a really, really important part of this process to not tell students information, but ask them questions that will connect them to their personal experience and then have the answers come from them. And, uh, and so, and they will change much more likely, be much more likely to change their behavior if that happens. Check to see if it's correct, if it's not correct, figure out the, where the mistake was made without consulting the solution. And this is still just with the examples. And so then when you get to the actual homework problems, try to do two or three or four um, at a rapid pace, because one of the reasons so many students run out of time on tests is they've never given themselves practice speeding up doing things. And once they do that, then it gets them in, puts them kind of in the same uh, frame of mind that they'd have to be in on a test when they are under time constraints. And this is what uh, Dana and a number of students uh, who I've asked, you know, what was the biggest uh, impact thing that you did? They'll say, when I changed the way I did my homework. So I think it's really important to, to share this with students. And, um, and so it, this is the email that, that she sent on January 20th. I started to use the get more out of your homework method, reviewed my notes right before attempting my homework problems, tried to work the problems without help from the solutions manual or tutors. If I still couldn't get the right answer, I'd look at my notes again to get a hint, but not to study the problem and mimic it step by step. And uh, more students than I thought actually started doing that, and they did very well. Now, Travis was a junior in psychology, and uh, he'd made a 47 and 52 on the first two tests. And uh, reading comprehension was his problem. He would tell me, he said, you know, well, I read the stuff, um, but when I get to the test, when I see the questions, it's like, I know I've read this, but I don't remember it well enough to answer the questions. And in fact, how many of you have students who you think have real reading comprehension problems? And, yeah, and how many of the students actually recognize that? Do you think they realize that? Yeah, okay, a lot of them do. Um, but I didn't know how to tell students how to read. And um, so I went to a four-week summer workshop, learned a very simple uh, strategy to tell students. And uh, some of the steps are preview the text before reading. Because one of the reasons that we don't get a lot out of what we read is you start to read, you get a little ways in, and then your mind starts to wander. Does that happen to people? Yeah, your mind starts to wander. And if you're like me, you don't realize that your mind is wandering until you've gotten two or three paragraphs down the road. And then as soon as you, remember, you realize, I'm not paying any attention to this stuff. I don't know what I just read. What do you do at that point? I start over. This is what students say when I do student sessions because I'm asking, it says start over. Um, but the problem is if you don't have any new strategies, you may get a little bit further, but you're not going to get much further because you don't have any different strategies. And so if you preview the text before reading to give yourself an overview of what you're about to read, take it section by section, but look at the bold face print, the italicized words, any charts or graphs. We know from cognitive science that if your brain has an overview, a big picture of what it's about to learn, and then it gets specific details to fill in that big picture, it is much more efficient at learning than if it just started to read, getting individual details, trying to create its own big picture. And so if you preview the text before reading to get the overview, and then come up with questions that you want the reading to answer for you, and then when you start to read, just read the first paragraph and then stop, put that information in your own words, 
Read the second paragraph, stop, put that information in your own words, trying to fold in what was in the first paragraph, and then do the third paragraph the same way, then it makes a huge difference. Now, when I'm talking to students at this point, I'll stop and I'll say, does it sound like if you have to do all that, it's gonna take a long time to get through the reading? Does it sound like it would take a long time? Yes, students would say absolutely, but I have found, because again, I ask students you know, to let me know how it worked, and with the reading strategy, I don't even have to ask them. They'll come back and I'll say, that reading strategy was fantastic. I am doing that. I'm getting so much more out of my reading now, and, uh, and I've taught this strategy to law school students, med school students, grad students, because they haven't learned these uh, techniques either, but they all say the same thing. It made a huge difference, and so I'll ask, I said, now, are you finding that using this is taking you a long time? or longer to do the reading than it was doing before. And to a person, they will say, well, no, actually, I finished the reading sooner using this strategy than what I was doing before. And so my question to you is, why should it take less time to do this than what they were doing before? Anybody have any ideas? Yes, all the way on the back. Absolutely, yes. Um, you read the, oh yeah, everybody read the book, so I know you read the book, yes, yes. But you're right, and he put both reasons together. Now when I ask this to students, and again, students gotta come up with this stuff, I'll ask them, you know, why do you think, and the first thing they'll say is, you're not doing all that rereading, and then they say you're more focused, and you put them all together, and absolutely. So the old way, you would read a little bit, but then you have to go back. So it's read, go back, read, go back, read, go back, read, go back. With the new way, you are moving more slowly through the material, but you get to the end point sooner because you're not doing all that back and forth. And also, you speed up as the process goes because can you imagine when you get to the eighth paragraph, if you've understood everything in the first seven, are you going to be able to read the eighth paragraph faster? Absolutely, yes. And so students are, uh, they, they will do this. And uh, psychologists call previewing the text before reading and developing questions, developing that anticipatory set. So you have a purpose for doing the reading and, and you're gonna uh, dive into it. Now on the next slide, um, this is just, um, sort of summarize this, the whole process into SQ5R. Now how many people have heard of SQ3R? Okay, a few people. That was just survey, question, uh, read, recite, review. Now there are a couple of other um, R's. Um, one is, well, the first thing, survey, as we said, then come up with questions, then read one paragraph at a time while you're summarizing in your own words, and then, uh, re yeah, reciting, summarize. And then one of the other R's is annotate, you know, write in the margin. If you have questions, if you have comments, and then the other one is to review, summarize the information, and then the last R is reflect. You know, what are some other views? Because if you're reading, uh, let's say, a sociology book that puts forth a theory about human behavior, then just think, what part of this do I not agree with with the author? Uh, if, or if it's a um, um, math book or quantitative book, what parts of this chapter were less clear to me? If I were in a conversation with the author, what section would I ask him or her to rewrite? So it's actually an active reading process. And a lot of students just love this because again, what I find is that if we can give students very, very specific things that they need to do, uh, as opposed to just saying, well, you need to study harder or you need to read for comprehension, then it's much more likely that they're going to do that. And so now I wanna be very careful here because the, I don't want to, Oh, okay, no, this is uh, just the impact. Uh, one of the, the Sachs uh, guys uh, was, um, he actually already had a PhD, but he was trying to teach himself uh, calculus and physics. And I met him at the Summer Institute. He sent me an email August 11th and then another one July 12th. He started re using this reading strategy. And uh, he was uh, using it to make headway in calculus and physics. Uh, he said the methods you outline, especially active reading, create a learning experience that's interactive even when you're studying the material alone. And this is what students um, say. Um, when he was learning calculus and physics, it was a struggle, but now it's progressing smoothly. This is the, the ultimate divide and conquer approach. And he said also, it makes the subjects way more interesting. And this is what students have said, because when they are doing the reading and they're actively engaged, it's no longer just a chore that they've got to do to get through, but they're actually uh, actively engaged in it. 
And so, okay, yes. Yeah. So on the next slide, um, there is going to be a passage that uh, I want you to, to read, and then at the end, I'm going to ask you a question about it. And so, yeah, so let's read that. Okay, now you may not have gotten through it. I'm just gonna take it off the screen. I always wish I had a camera at this point so I could show you the expressions of people out there. Some people are squinting and some people are like, what? Um, now, for people who haven't read the book, is there anybody who thinks that you would be able to just summarize what was in that passage just from what was on the screen? Okay, probably not. But what if you had known before you started reading that that passage was about the first voyage of Christopher Columbus? So now I want you to read it again and then just shake your head up and down yes or back and forth no uh, if it makes more sense to you now that you know what it was about. Okay, I'm seeing some people say yes because now we know what that egg not a table refers to. Your eyes deceive you. It said an egg not a table correctly typifies this unexplored planet. Now we know who the three sisters were, sturdy sisters were, right? Yeah, and so when students experience something like this, they can see that, ah, if I know what I'm reading about, then when I read, things are gonna make a lot more sense. And so what I would suggest you do is just take a passage uh, from one of your classes, something that students don't know about, and then just have them read it, not knowing what it's about, and then tell them what it's about, have them read it again, and have them experience that if you just take the time to do this preview, then your reading is gonna go a lot more smoothly. And the source for that um, is, is this. Okay, now I wanna talk a little bit because um, Using the textbook is something that is, I think, really, really important. But um, a lot of students don't have the textbook, and I know cost is, is sometimes uh, a problem, but there are a lot now of more open source uh, textbooks. And there's some institutions where the Student Government Association has opened up a center where students can uh, donate books after they've used them. But it's really, really important for students to have books. But most of the students will not realize that they need books. And part of it is this. How many of you know that there are a lot of faculty members who tell students, you don't really need to buy the book for this course? Are you familiar with that? Yeah. When I talk to students, I'll say, how many of you ever heard a professor say, you don't really need to buy the book for this course? All the hands go up. And I say, well, oh, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but those professors are lying to you. They are lying to you when they say you don't need to use a book. I said, but don't get mad at them because they don't know they're lying to you. In fact, they think they're helping you out. What do you think they think they're doing? And students get it every time. What do they think they're doing? Saving the money, exactly. But then I say, yeah, that's exactly what they think. But what's more expensive? Buying the chemistry textbook and getting a, uh, I'm sorry, um, yeah, buying the chemistry textbook or not buying the textbook and getting a C in the course that's going to keep you out of medical school buying the history book or getting a D in history that's gonna keep you from law school. And they quickly realize that buying the textbook is probably not so expensive at all if it's going to really help me succeed. And so the little activity I do with students to actually help them feel that this is important. So it's not just about my saying, you need to buy the book, but it's about putting them through experiences that show them the impact that it makes. And so I'll do this, I'll uh, ask them, what is the first word um, that comes to mind when you see that? What's the first word that comes to mind? Cat. cat. And sometimes they'll say cot, sometimes cut, but in, any of those, but most say cat. Now, would this word have come to your mind if we lived in a culture that didn't have any cats and we didn't see that word growing up? What do you think? No, yeah, absolutely not. And that's what students say, no. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that our brains will automatically fill in missing information if we see stuff that we're really, really familiar with that large chunks can be left out of. And so then I'll ask the students, well, what are you supposed to use? What are you supposed to use to learn from if you don't have the book? And what are they supposed to use? 
The notes, exactly, the notes. And I said, absolutely. But the notes, I say, are the C space D version of the information. That's why the chapter might have 40 pages, but you have 10 pages of notes. And so I said, now when the professor looks at the notes, and actually those professors say, you don't need to buy the book because everything on the test is gonna come just from the notes. And I said, absolutely. But when the professor looks at the notes, they're seeing C-A-T, but you're seeing C space T. And does your brain have any information to fill in what's missing from sociology or from psychology or from anatomy and physiology? And they'll say no. I said, absolutely. And then to bring it home, I say, now, when the professor is writing the test, do you think they're going to write the test from what your brain sees in the notes or from what their brain sees in the notes? And which is it? Yeah, their brain. And so I said, absolutely. And the only way for your brain to see what their brain sees in the notes is to buy the book and use the book. And I've had students say, wow, I didn't know the book could be that useful. And so this is another thing that we really have to help students understand that they really do need the book. And the difference in performance that they see when they start reading the book is, is huge. And so the other thing that I will do with students, because again, it's all about reflection questions, helping them think through this, is I'll ask them a couple of uh, questions. What's the difference, if you think there's any difference at all, what's the difference between studying and learning? And then the next question is, for which task would you work harder? And the first task is I say, if, if I say two weeks from now, we're going to have the next test in this course. And you didn't do so well on the first one. And so you have to make an A on this next test if you're going to do uh, reasonably well on this course. You know how hard you would work for that. The second uh, question is, the, the second scenario oh, oh, is I'll say, two weeks from now, we're going to have the next test in this class. And I've decided to give the class what everybody wanted me to do before the first test. But I didn't do it because I didn't think the class needed it. Everybody wanted me to give a review session. I said, no, you don't need a review session. This is college. That, that was high school stuff. But the class did really poorly on the first test. So I'm going to offer a review session before this next test is coming up. And you are going to teach that review session. I'm going to have you come up to the front of the class, and you are going to explain all the important concepts, paying particular attention to the more difficult concepts to make sure everybody is prepared for the test the next day. Would you work harder for one of those than the other? And if so, which one? So what I want you to do is take about 15 seconds to get your own answer to those questions, and then just turn to the person next to you or in groups of uh, the two or three, and discuss their answers. And we'll come back in a minute and see how we feel about answering those questions as a group. So start thinking and talking for a minute. Thirty more seconds. <laughs> okay. Okay, we had some great discussion out there. And um, believe it or not, when I first started trying this uh, technique with students, this think, pair, share, 
I didn't really think, I wasn't really enthusiastic about it because uh, I didn't think that students would really engage in discussions. I didn't think that they would come up with useful information. Um, but they will have as robust a discussion as you had here. So I encourage you to, to throw that out. And so we'll see what we came up with. Um, and I'll ask now, is there anybody here who would say that studying and learning are exactly the same thing? And typically there isn't. Uh, so would someone share with the group how you characterized the difference between studying and learning? Now, I know y'all were talking out there, so. <laughs> okay, yes. Excellent, and I don't know if everybody heard that, but she said study, and this is the number one answer I get from students. They haven't thought about it before we ask this question, but they'll say studying, she said studying is looking at the information with the idea that I need to know this stuff for the test, but learning is really going over the information with the idea that this is something that I need to know. Did you say for the rest of my life? I get, I will need it or to do what I want to do with my life, absolutely. And that's what students say, okay, see a, a hand here and then we'll go here, yes. Ah, uh, studying is the attempt, learning is the success. Now, that's the number one answer I get from students. That's the number one answer I get from faculty. Uh, they'll say, ah, studying is the process, learning is the product. Students pretty much never say that. Um, and, uh, oh, and I'll tell students, I'll say, this is what faculty say a lot, but how many of you have ever studied and the intent was not even to learn? All the hands go up. And, say, and what was the intent? What were you studying for? And what were they studying for? to make an A on the test, exactly. So great answer, and you're right, that's what it should be. Studying should be the process to get to the result of learning. But without, and that's what I like about this discussion, we can have that with students because most of them, that's not what they're studying for, but we can help them understand that that is really the goal, yes. And where was my number three? Oh, yes. Oh, okay, so kind of what he said. Yep, anybody think of another way to distinguish? Well, as I said, number one is they'll say studying is just memorizing information for a test or quiz. Learning is when I understand that information, I can apply it, I can relate it to what I've already known. Sometimes they'll say studying is short term, learning is long term. And I'll say, okay, now if we take that as the distinction between studying and learning, would you say up to this point you've been primarily in study mode or in learn mode? And what do you think they tell me? Study mode, absolutely. And I said, yes. And I you tell them, you're like all other students. Um, because most students don't even know what there is a learn mode to be in. Because we've already always focused on studying. I said, absolutely. And so we're going to talk about a very specific uh, learning strategy that's not studying, and uh, or not just studying. And then for the second one, I think we can do this in unison. Uh, would you work harder for A or B? and that's what most of the students say. And then when I ask them, well, why would you work harder for B, what do you think they tell me? Okay, and I'm hearing both, yeah. Uh, so I said, well, most of the time they said, well, I gotta really know it if I have to teach it. And then I said, well, you know, kind of guess what? You really have to know it to make an A on the test. But that has not been their experience, as we've seen before. And so since they only have the experience they've had, there's no way for them to know that I have to really know it to make an uh, A on the test. You know, uh, I mean, to make an, they really have to know it to make an A on the test. But they do realize that they really have to know it to, if they have to teach it. And then the other answer I heard uh, somebody say is, I don't want to look embarrassed. I don't want to be embarrassed. Sometimes I say, I don't look stupid in front of the class. And then there's this third answer that I get a lot. Anybody thought of another reason that you might work harder if you had to teach it? Exactly. Who said that? Oh, there you go. Yes, yeah. They say, well, now everybody's performance is depending upon what I say. Oh, I just, she's not going to want me to do this. But I've just seen the queen of sax walk in the room. And this is Dr. <laughs> this is Dr. Bell Whelan. <laughs> welcome, welcome. I said I was recalling the song on the graduation, but I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I figured she'd come in just to see what I was saying, but no. Um, but yeah, so the, the third reason is they say, well, now everybody's performance depends on me. And I want to make sure that I can explain it more than one way. I can use different kinds of methods. And so they really get into it. And then I ask, up to this point in time, have you been more in scenario A mode or scenario B mode? And what do you think they tell me? A, exactly. And so I tell, this is great. I said, I love it when the more things you're doing wrong, the better it is. Because the greater the prognosis that when you change things, uh, you're going to see a big difference in your performance. And what you'll notice is the presentation to students, the discussion with students, I think, is probably 40% information and 60% inspiration and motivation to help them really feel that this is going to make a difference in, in their lives. And so then I go on and say, you know, the good news about this is you don't have to have your own class to be in teach the material mode. Uh, if you have empty chairs in your room, if you have stuffed animals, if you have imaginary friends, if you have any audience, either real or imagined, that you can pretend you're teaching this stuff to, it makes all the difference in the world because of this. How many of us in this room have ever been in a situation where you were explaining something to someone, something that you thought you understood totally, but then you got to a point where, hmm, I'm not so sure about this part. Yeah, it happens to everybody. Students say it happens to them, and I said, absolutely. Now, if it was class material that you were explaining to someone, if you had not been in the process of explaining this to somebody, when would you have found out that you didn't totally understand this information? And when would it have been? On the test. Yeah, would it, uh, did somebody say something other than on the test? Oh, in teach book. Oh, okay. While you're teaching it. Yes, yes, yes. And you, you discover it then, or you're going to find out on the test. Again, I'm not telling students, you got to do this, or you're going to screw up on the test. They're telling me that I'm going to just find out on the test. And so then I get students who will do this. They just you know, pretend that they're teaching the information. And um, this one student uh, at uh, Eastern Kentucky University, I did a presentation there October 29th, and he loved that strategy. And so he sent me uh, an email on January 18th that he, he loved the strategy. He lived alone, but he had a baby Groot plant. And so he was uh, studying for a psychology licensure exam, and he was going to use this strategy by teaching the information to Baby Groot. He messaged me on April 14th that everything was going great. He and Baby Groot were having big fun. And then on June 11th, he got the results back from the test, and he said that he just found out that he'd, weighed, he'd made a score way higher than he really needed to make to get his license, and he was pretty sure that if Baby Groot had taken the test, he would have passed it also. And so these are the kinds of things that I share with students. And you won't believe the number of students who've sent me you know, pictures of their teddy bears or their dolls or, or people that they're pretending that they're teaching it to. And in class, when you're having students uh, you know, in small groups or even you know, having a student uh, come up to the front of the class and explain a concept, then they get in the habit of doing that and it, it makes a, a really big difference. And so I want to do a little exercise with you now that shows you know, why it is that students, I'm so confident that students could be making a you know, 10, 12, 20 on one test and 90, 100 on the next test. So this is a little activity. On the next slide, there are going to be a series of words or short phrases, and they all have vowels in them. And I'm going to give you 45 seconds to count the vowels. Now, if you finish before 45 seconds are up, I just want you to go back and recheck and make sure you have exactly the right number of vowels. But we all have to stop at 45 seconds, and I will give you the five-second warnings. Everybody ready? OK, so let's start counting the vowels now. Five seconds, and stop. Now I'd like to know how many of the words or phrases you remember from the previous slide. <laughs> OK, and we'll do this by a show of hands. Uh, <laughs> there were 15 words or phrases on the slide. Anybody think you uh, remembered more than 10? OK, so raise your hand when I get to the number that you did remember. Nine, eight, seven. Six, five, four, three, two, one. 
five, four, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> okay, uh, so it looked like our average was probably somewhere between two and three. I'll give us the benefit of the doubt and say three. Three out of 15 is about 20%. Uh, what letter grade is 20%? <laughs> kind of F minus, right? Yeah, kind of F is hard to, <laughs> to bring out of the gutter. Um, but I'm gonna ask you to look at the words again. And if you look at them from top to bottom, you're gonna find that they are arranged according to something. And if you haven't done this exercise in the book, uh, just yell it out when you see what they're arranged according to. Yes, numbers, I heard somebody say it, numbers. Dollar bill for one, dice for two, tricycle, four leaf clover, hand, six pack, seven up, etc. So now I'm gonna give you 45 seconds to memorize the words or phrases, and this time when I take them off the screen, I want you to just close your eyes and silently recite them to yourself, and then when you think you've remembered as many as you're going to remember, then just open up your eyes, okay? So start memorizing the words now. Five seconds, and stop. So just close your eyes and silently recite them to yourself and open your eyes when you think you've remembered as many as you're gonna remember. Okay, now I'm sure you'd remember more if I gave you more time, but in the interest of time, let's just uh, see where we are. Did you do a lot better that time? Okay, and I saw some people indicate that they'd gotten all 15. How many of you got all 15 this time around? Wow, okay, and so I'm not gonna go through the whole count, but let me ask this, how many of you got at least three times more this time than you got last time? Okay, yes, and usually the average is somewhere around 12 or 13. And so if you got three times more, that means you could have made a 30 on the first test and a 90 on the next test. And I like to share this with students because I say, now the point of this exercise is we are not any smarter people in the room than we were five minutes ago when the average was about three. But there were two major differences between the first and second attempt. What was one of the differences? Yeah, the focus, we knew exactly what the task was. And then what was the other difference? Exactly, we knew how it was organized. We had a mnemonic device. We knew what the task was and we knew how the information was organized. And the way this translates to students is, I think we have to be very, very careful when we describe to students what we want them to do. So if we say, I want you to read this section before you come to class tomorrow, they are hearing that as, I want your eyes to fall over every other word while you're texting your friends or on Facebook. Where what we mean is, I want you to read this and come prepared to lead the class in a discussion on this material. If we tell them that, they will do something differently. When my chemistry professors gave me homework problems, I thought the task was to turn in the problems done correctly. So I used the examples and got them all right. But that wasn't their task at all. What they wanted me to do was understand the concepts and be able to work problems, not just like those problems, but any problems that tested that concept. And so I needed to understand the whole concept. I can't go all the way back there now, but I'm pretty sure if I could, I would have done something differently if I had known that's what the real goal was. And so I think that we have to be very specific in helping students understand that. And then for the second part, knowing how the information was organized. Um, and again, we don't have to tell students this. I'm a big proponent of the less we tell students and the more we let them figure out for themselves, the better. So after uh, discussing a new concept, it might be, what from your everyday experience does this remind you of? 
It doesn't have to be directly related to the content, but it just reminds you of this. And why does it remind you of this? Cognitive scientists call that developing an anchor for the material. And if we can help students do that, it makes a big difference. Now, this is interesting, okay. Um, Okay, yeah, and as you heard, I didn't really know much about this stuff when, uh, when I started. And so, uh, let me just go back to um, how people, <laughs> this is going bananas. Okay, how people learn. How many people are familiar with this book? Okay, it, a, a few people are. It is a great book. If you Google it now, uh, you can get a free PDF version. And um, it has great information about metacognition, about uh, learning strategies in different areas like writing, like mathematics, like science. And uh, this was one of the things that I read that uh, helped me to understand what this was all about. And the fact of the matter is, is we know a lot now about learning that we didn't know before. One, we know that active learning is much more lasting than passive learning. We know that thinking about thinking is very important. Teaching students the concept of metacognition and using the term, which is what I love about your QEP, all of your students will, will know this, is, is really, really important. And we also know that the level at which learning occurs is important, and that's where Bloom's taxonomy comes in. And so the way that I explain uh, Bloom's is just a hierarchy of learning levels, and I realize that it's not, when Bloom's did it, he didn't do it as a hierarchy. But again, I find that to help students understand how to use it best, if we present it as a hierarchy, then it makes a lot of sense. And you can see that evaluating and analyzing two of those five skills that you want students to gain they're at the upper levels. And um, so when I explain it to students, uh, d really defining each of the levels, this is just strict memorizing, now you can put things in your own words, now you can answer questions, work problems you've never seen before, now you can take any concept, break it down into simpler concepts, now you can look at two ideas, two theories, and know if one is more likely to be correct than another, and then creating, now you can come up with your own ideas, your own theories. When I present this to students and I ask them, um, and, and as I said, they're fascinated with the information, but when we teach it, they, they really learn it, and when I ask them to think back to high school and tell me what was the highest level they think they had to operate in high school to get A's and B's in their high school classes, just raise your fingers, one, two, three, four, five, six, and tell me what level you think they said. Okay, I'm seeing ones, most of them say uh, ones and twos, and I've got a few years of data to show you. In 2008, the big bump was at two, so, and I encourage you to ask this, you know, of your students. Um, in 2013, uh, the big bump was at one. But then uh, in 2014, it was back to the big bump was at uh, understanding. But you can see that the vast majority, one, two, and three. But then when I ask them, and remember I'm doing this after they've been in college for a little while, after they've had at least the first test, and I ask them, now knowing what you know about Blooms and what you know about college, what's the lowest level you're gonna have to routinely operate to make the A's you're totally capable of making in your college classes? And what level, hold up your fingers again, what level do you think they tell me? Okay, I'm seeing some threes, some fours. You're gonna be pleasantly surprised um, to know that in 2008, um, the big bump was at, at, uh, at four, so fours, fives, and sixes. Okay, um, and then in 2013, the big bump again was at four. And then in 2014, uh, rather, the big bump was even at six. And so they recognize if they've got to do term papers, if they've got to do projects, then they've got to be at creating. And so then that's the third piece of the puzzle. That's why they are not making the A's, learning the stuff that they could, because they were in study mode and not learn mode. They were working to make A's on tests rather than preparing to teach the information. And now we see that they're operating at lower levels of blooms. And so it's one thing to know you're at lower levels, but how do you get yourself higher? and uh, we teach them the study cycle. And this is just a study system that is based on Frank Chris. Uh, he called it preview, learn, review, study system, and students love it. 
So I really urge you to uh, you know, make copies of this slide, uh, give it to every student. Um, it, it's just a five-step, very simple process that students can put in place that gives them something to do during their studying. Because how many times have you heard students say, I just don't know how to study? Have you heard students say that? Yeah, I used to hear it all the time. And I remember thinking, what do you mean you don't know how to study? Just study. <laughs> you know? uh, but this process, uh, where the first step is to preview information before you go to class, so you prepare your brain for learning the information. And then the second is just go to class. Go to class. You have to be in class. But as part of the previewing, you're looking at the syllabus, then go to the textbook, look at the bold phase print, italicized words, get an overview of what the professor is going to talk about, and then come up with questions that you want the lecture to answer for you so you are creating this purpose for going to class. And then when you go to class, you can be actively engaged as opposed to just sitting there taking dictation. And then the next step is uh, after class, as soon after class as possible, review what just happened. And the evidence that I like to give students for the importance of that step is I'll ask them and I'll ask you, how many of you have ever seen a movie, any movie, more than one time? Okay, and how many of us have noticed that the second time around, we see things that we didn't even know were there the first time? Yeah, and students say the same thing. When you review what just happened in class, your brain is going to see stuff that it didn't notice before, so you've got to do that. Now, the preview and review uh, steps only take about 10 minutes if you do them efficiently, so you've got to do more than that. And we show them how to structure study sessions. We call them intense study sessions. Set aside about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, not much longer than that. But so many students nowadays have ADHD. Have you noticed that? And so we tell them, you can adapt this, and you can make it for 10 minutes. Um, but the idea is, how do I structure this? If you set the first minute or so to set a goal for what you want to accomplish, and then for the next uh, 30 to 50 minutes, or next 8 to 9 minutes, if you have ADHD, then study with focus and then take a break and reward yourself, and then come back and review what you've just studied. And what we recommend they do is t try to do two or three of these during daylight hours. And then if they can do another one or two or at night, they've studied for four to five hours that day, and most people don't study that much in a whole week. Students love this. They say, wow, now I have a plan to follow. So I would urge you uh, to do that. And so I know we're finishing up at about uh, 12, um, 15. Although I started two minutes late, so maybe I'll go to 12, 17. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. All right. And so uh, I, I want to show you what happens because you can teach uh, these learning strategies individually or you can teach them in a whole class situation. And it works very well. Uh, I wanted to show you the results of the... Um, presenting this to a general chemistry class, and again, we don't present it until after the first exam, so it's about the same, but then the students who were there that day, and we don't tell them that something's going to be different that day, so the population of students who attended versus uh, did not, there wasn't any difference in their characteristics, but uh, these folks went up to 77, these folks went down to 69, into the uh, semester whole letter grade difference. And now the discipline specific journals are interested in publishing this stuff. It used to be the case that we as faculty said, you know, I got to do research in my, my academic area in, in order to gain any kind of, uh, of respect or credibility. That is no longer the case. It is now possible for us to do research in the scholarship of teaching and learning to pay attention to these things, and now the discipline-specific journals are interested in publishing this. Now, in uh, 2012, okay, let me go back. In 2012, we did it again, and uh, what we found, um, okay, yeah, well, for the, sorry, okay, this was uh, tw Chem 2012 in 2013. Um, the end, this was the second semester course, two letter grade difference between the people who heard just this one 50 minute presentation and the people who didn't. And then in uh, spring of 2015, she asked me to do it again after the first three exams. And there the people who heard the presentation had a lower average on the first three exams than the people who were absent. But still by the end of the course, these folks finished with a whole letter grade higher. 
than the people who are not there. And so it really is very, very impactful no matter where in the semester you do it. But I always encourage people to do it after the first exam because then that gives students uh, more time to, to implement this. And again, uh, it is uh, publishable in discipline-specific journals. Uh, we published our work in Journal of Chemical Education. We had a colleague who published in Journal of College Science Teaching. They're now social science journals who also like to publish this information too. Now, I have a, uh, just a few slides on mindset because I'm told that a lot of you are reading it now. This is the work of, of uh, Jennifer, um, I'm sorry, of Carol Dweck. And um, it has to do with people's idea of intelligence. And what she and her group found was that most people have one of two views about intelligence. Either they think that you're born with a certain amount of intelligence, it's not gonna change very much, she calls that a fixed mindset. Or the other view is you can change your intelligence, you can grow your intelligence by your actions. And uh, that's very, very important distinction because the responses to many situations are based on your mindset. Uh, the way you respond to challenges. People with a fixed mindset avoid challenges, uh, but people with a growth mindset embrace challenges. People with a fixed mindset give up very easily and they think effort is fruitless because they think either you're smart enough to do it without trying or you're not smart enough to succeed at all so they don't spend any effort on it. Whereas these folks, the folks with a growth mindset persist through obstacles and they see effort as the path to mastery. And even the response to criticism and the success of others is different in the two groups. And so I think it's really, really important for, help, for us to help students understand these two views and to help them be in touch with which mindset they have. So let me just ask, if I were to ask you, which mindset about student intelligence do you think most students have? Fixed, exactly, and for good reason. We socialize them into that. When they were in second, third grade, they saw the blue group, the green group, the yellow group. They knew what those groups meant. And when they got to 12th grade, had the pecking order changed one bit? No, the smart kids were still the smart kids, the slow kids were still the slow kids. And so that's why they think that. Now, what about faculty? If I were to ask you what mindset about uh, student intelligence do you think most faculty have, what would you say? Fixed or growth for most faculty? Okay, I'm hearing fixed. Well, let me do this by show of hands. How many of you would say fixed? How many of you would say growth? Now, it's very interesting, and I'm not too surprised uh, that at Georgia Military College, you would say growth because that's the opinion that you have. But the other folks who said fixed, they were answering for all your colleagues who are not here uh, <laughs> because most of them are fixed. And one time I asked that question and, uh, about faculty, uh, and the response came back from the audience, are you talking about STEM faculty? And so, so then I added that question, what mindset about intelligence do you think most STEM faculty have and what do you think? Okay, uh, some, the response there came back, more fixed. And uh, yeah, because sometimes, well, I only want the smart students in my lab. And so I think, and I know I had a fixed mindset about, you know, student intelligence. And so I think that we need to, uh, to be in tune with that uh, also. Okay, and so these are just a couple of emails I wanted to share with you, a uh, student in general chemistry. He e emails me April 6th, personally I'm not so good at chemistry, I want you to tutor me. Many of the students who think they need tutoring don't really need tutoring, they just need a session on metacognition and using critical thinking. I didn't spend a nanosecond tutoring this guy, I gave him the talk about how to do the homework differently. He didn't even have the textbook um, because it was listed as optional on the syllabus and he hadn't even noticed that it was on there, but I had him buy the book and he ended up making an A in the course and he sent me his grades. Uh, he told me he started with a 60D. I think what I did different was make side notes in each chapter now that he has the textbook. And as I progressed into the next chapter, I was able to refer to these notes. I would say that in chemistry, everything builds from the previous topic. Now, I think his instructor probably thought he had gotten that idea by April 6th, but he had not gotten the basic idea that you know everything builds on what we've already done. Um, some of the changes that faculty have made that have improved learning and performance, I won't uh, read these, you can, but just giving that one 50-minute session, uh, even 20 minutes, there was a uh, person at uh, UConn who did it, and there was a psychology professor at a community college in Georgia who provided the learning strategies information to students after test one, and she told them about mindset, and she sent her data to me, 
and uh, she talked about the at-risk student population. Uh, there were nine students who their average on the first exam was 62.67. Then they went up to 77, exam two, 78, exam three, 82, exam four, 82.6 on the final which was shocking to her because usually the score on the comprehensive final goes down. But what she did, it was a comprehensive exam. She put them in teams, and each team was assigned three chapters that they had to review to the class. And she said that was really, really effective and uh, did a lot of things. So that might be a strategy that you could try. And so as I finish up, I just want to introduce you to a um, graduate student who had failed all of his cumulative exams except one his first year. And, uh, and they have to pass six the first two years or they're kicked out of the PhD program. And I'm sure I would not have gotten anybody at LSU to bet me a dime that if he only passed one his first year, he could pass five out of eight the second year. And actually, he didn't pass five out of eight the second year. He passed five out of seven the second year. And he passed the December exam with the highest score in the group. And this is he, Dr. Algernon Kelly. He got his PhD in 2009. He's the only person I know on the planet who has a PhD in chemistry who started every single course at the developmental level. Math, writing, reading, everything developmental. And now he has a PhD in analytical chemistry. And so when he left LSU, he started teaching at Xavier University in New Orleans. And um, is that my time is up signal? No, okay. <laughs> oh, you know this guy? Oh, we'll talk, okay. And I saw somebody doing this. It's like, is he about to open up the trap door on me? Uh, no, okay. <laughs> okay, but, and I am over a minute, but one minute I promise and we'll be out of here. Uh, but um, he started teaching at his students at Xavier, and I like to uh, end with these uh, series of emails. Um, on October 17th, this guy writes him, I'm struggling, I really want to succeed, but everything is just ending in a, in a decent grade. So what kind of grades was he making? Exactly, and he was pre-med. Um, one, we, I, I was hoping you could mentor me and guide me down the path that's going to help me realize my true potential. One week later, he goes, hey, Dr. Kelly, made 84 on my chem exam compared to 56 on my first one using your method for two days without prior intent studying. And then on, October, on November 3rd, he writes, uh, hey, Dr. Kelly, and you notice his mood changes from, hello, Dr. Kelly, hey, Dr. Kelly, hey, Dr. Kelly, exclamation point. Increased my bio exam from 76 to 91.5 using your system. Ever since I started your study cycle program, my grades have significantly improved. I've honestly gained a sense of hope and confidence here at Xavier. And this is what this stuff does. It gives students hope and confidence because they see a way forward. He says, my family and I are really grateful that you've taken the time to get me back on track. You have a lot of first generation students, right? And they come to college with the hopes and dreams of their family with them. When they're struggling, they don't know how to fix it. Their families don't know how to fix it, but this stuff uh, definitely will. And so in conclusion, um, here at Georgia Military College, we can provide an atmosphere where students will improve their ability to think critically. Uh, but in order to do that in a spirit of love and making sure that every institution is on the same page, I love that in your four um, strategic initiatives where you're focused on student success, but the whole institution is acting as one. We can teach students how to learn. We can make the learning visible. We can also make sure that we don't judge student potential on their initial performance. Performance. And we can't let them do it either because a lot of them will want to do that. We've got to encourage them to persist in the face of initial failure, and we have to encourage the use of meta college, metacognitive tools for developing the bright idea. And uh, so uh, there's a, a wonderful resource um, oh, okay. uh, here, the uh, Academic Support Services. Anybody here from that unit? Ah, wonderful, okay, and so they know all this stuff, they can, can help out, and so um, some of the useful websites, and I put that uh, Academic Support Center on the, uh, that's the very first one, and uh, then these are some references, these are some, uh, oh, this is a new reference that most times I have to show this and people don't know it, but you already know it, so uh, that's it. Thank you very, very much.